On Ascension Day 1978, the Composite South African Parachute Battalion jumped onto the tactical headquarters of Swapo's Plan Army, based at Kasinga, 250 kilometers north of the Angolan Southwest African border. Their objective was to destroy the facility, their logistics, and wipe out a strong concentration of Swapo guerrillas that had gathered in preparation for a massive incursion into Southwest Africa to disrupt the first democratic elections scheduled for Southwest Africa later that year. The airborne assault was an unparalleled success. The entire base was destroyed and was never used again. However, the attack highlighted many shortcomings, some of which almost led to a disastrous outcome of that battle. Colonel Jan Breitenbach resolved that what was needed as a first priority was a Pathfinder company, a specially trained and manned organization that could be dropped ahead of the main airborne assault to guide aircraft to the correct drop zones and assist paratroopers to quickly concentrate into their tactical formations in order to fully exploit the surprise factor associated with airborne assaults. A Pathfinder is a person who can go ahead of any airborne operation or an air mobile operation. They can scout out the area, gather intelligence, and guide the other troops in. That's what, uh, that's what a Pathfinder's basic role is, to be able to pave the way so that the other people can either airborne drop in or come in through helicopter assault. He's the advance person, the advance team. He's your first eyes on the ground. They're usually also the eyes on the ground on the eyes on the target the whole time. That Pathfinder might stay there after the operation's over with and just gather more intelligence to see what else is coming in. Because these men had to be regulars and could not be drawn from the essentially citizen force of 44 Parachute Brigade, Colonel Breitenbach launched a recruiting drive drawing many men from the now disbanded Rhodesian Light Infantry, predominantly foreigners who had answered the call to duty to protect the innocent from the evils of communist-inspired terrorism. I was always raised to believe that there's right and wrong. There's no in-between. So equivocating being relativistic about it is a coward's way out. I was never able to test myself living in the United States. I felt like the test that I needed spiritually, morally, and physically had to be on the battlefield. That's why I went. I got back home, the Marine Corps had a lot of racial problems in it. There was DAP and, and all kinds of things and reverse discrimination. And I just, I was very disenchanted with, with America as a whole because we took a victory and we replaced it with a resounding defeat because of the cowardice of our political leaders. Uh, and, and like many veterans, I, was, I, I, I couldn't come to grips with that. I couldn't come to grips with the country. It was still divided. There was the older generation that said it was my country, right or wrong. You know, and, and Vietnam was a, was, a, was a worthy cause. And there was the others still running about like idiots and protesting and shouting and things about they didn't know of. I was, uh, came back to San Francisco. I couldn't get hired by the city of San Francisco because I wasn't the right mix of what they were looking for. Uh, I tried to get a job as a uh, law enforcement officer, but I was just a Vietnam vet. That's all I was. Uh, the support we felt for the people in Rhodesia was because they were our people. They were British people. Um, and Rhodesia, I've described as the best part of Surrey in the middle of Africa. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful country uh, created by the people who were there. Um, we did support them um, in their time of need, uh, say not politically, but amongst the, the general feeling in the population. Um, and amongst the, the service personnel in, in the army, there was great support for the people of Rhodesia and a number of us wanted to support their war efforts. The character of the brigade was reflected by its controversial commander, Colonel Jan Breitenbach, and its colourful CSM, Peter McLeese. I spoke to Breitenbach and he said, right, what I want you to do, I'm starting off a Pathfinder company, I'm going to put you in charge of the training for the earlier part of it, and you'll be up at a place called Mabalikwe. So, as each group of men came in, we shipped them up to Mabalikwe, which was, a, it was really good because we were, we were there, we were away from the, the rest of the army, totally on our own with 
an awful lot of ammunition. So what we did is, I, took, I looked at all the guys, and there was a, a big cross-section of guys. There was guys from the Rhodesia Regiment, there were guys from the RLI, there were guys from the SAS, guys from the Solo Scouts, guys from the Bay Scouts. I says, how do you mould all these guys back together? So I decided, I said, right, I'm taking this back to the basics. But it's going to be the basics with that bit extra, can you see it? So I, um, I started doing uh, basic tra uh, tactics, you know, uh, basic formations, everything. And we moved on from there, we moved on to immediate action drills, uh, camp attacks, uh, ambushes, every we covered the whole lot and everything was done live and I was really driving these guys to the extremes and I was driving myself with them. The unit settled into a routine of cross-border patrols, reconnaissance, observation posts and ambushes. At times they operated with 3-2 battalion, 1 para regiments and other units but more often than not they worked independently. Each Sabre vehicle within the column was its own unit, comprising a commander, a driver, a gunner, and a number two on the gun. These four men were often specialists in many other fields as well. The colonel picked his own command vehicle crew, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be picked as his driver. Um, Dave Barr was uh, picked as the gunner. He was by far the the most uh, capable uh, and astute of anybody in terms of heavy weapons and light weapons, so he was by far the obvious pick. Graham Gilmore, the obvious pick because of his radio and communication skills, former Grenadier Guardsman, uh, neat as a pin, always had everything just right. So the Colonel had a really good crew. In mid-August 1980, the Pathfinder Sabre Convoy joined the SADF forces assembled at Grootfontein for Operation Protea a massive attack on a FAPLA armoured brigade at Zangongo. Their role was as tank hunters. Again, this highly trained, highly motivated unit had been sidelined. Out on the flank, they saw little action during the main assault, but that would all soon change. Uh, we were then deployed uh, east to follow up on retreating FAPLA and SWAPO units, and we tracked them by vehicle. We were on our Sabre vehicles. We tracked them all day long. Uh, down sand tracks and uh, very, uh, very dangerous. Uh, we knew that they were running from us, but we figured that there were a lot of, that they would be mining the roads behind them. So we were extremely cautious. Uh, one of our Unimog logistics vehicles tipped a mine up, ran over the edge of it, and just tipped the mine up like that, never went off. Um, again, I was in the lead vehicle, so, you know, if anybody was going to hit a 10, it was going to be me. So again, you know, I was pretty puckered. Uh, at, some, at, at, at several points, we deployed, and, and, and uh, two of us went ahead on foot with probes, you know, knives on the end of sticks, trying to probe in the sand because we just really, we knew that something was going to happen here. And, and you know, it's funny. All that day long, the closer we got to them, the more, the more, the, the more bad feelings there were of just like something, something not good is going to happen. And, and it was all about, it was all about mines, it seemed like. The whole day was just about, you know, getting blown up. I know exactly how Lang felt because we all felt it. You know, this is, it's very demoralizing, this type of warfare. And, um, you know, as we carried on, they went to that hole in the fence. And I said to Graham just before that, I just, my, my hair was standing up on the back of my neck. Something was really wrong. And I said to Graham, I says, hey, guys, I says, stand by. I says, this, there's something going to happen here. I got about 50 meters uh, out of this uh, constricted crossing area. And the next thing that I recall was absolute dead silence. I heard a pop. This big ball of flame enveloped the whole vehicle, but I, I particularly remember it coming around me, and I could feel the heat burn in the back of my head and this flame coming around to my eyes and then the flame disappeared and it was nothing but smoke when I kind of woke up you know here I was out of the vehicle and I'm not really sure how I got out um, I looked back to the vehicle and I saw uh, Sergeant Gilmore he was had been blown out of the vehicle and he was right next to it the vehicle was burning fiercely and the flames were being blown away from the right side of the vehicle uh, Graham was on the left or on the right side here, I, and I heard Dave or somebody screaming. It turned out to be Dave, so I ran to 
to Gilly and I pulled him away the from the vehicle because I knew it was going to start to cook off and, and explode. We had a tremendous amount of ammunition. We had anti-tank rockets and mortars and, and fi a ton of 50 cal and grenades and so I knew that uh, things were going to get go from bad to worse pretty quickly. I felt myself being propelled up. Now whether that happened or not, I couldn't tell you, but I was certainly on my way up because I was looking down at the vehicle. As far as I know, I could have been blown out of my own body. And I thought I was dead. And I, and I, I said to myself, we've hit a mine, I'm dead, and soon I'm going to be standing in front of God and answering for my life. Well, he had other ideas. And I, I also witnessed the whole vehicle turn into a ball of fire. There were jerry cans of fuel, I believe four or six jerry cans of fuel on the back. They went, this whole thing is just a huge ball of fire. And I just, I felt that heat, I felt the heat of hell itself rising up at me as I fell back into it. And I heard Dave screaming, and Dave was right next to the vehicle where Gilly had been, but on the other side. And... I later, I don't know how he'd gotten out there, you know, I, I didn't see the colonel. <clears throat> I later learned that the colonel saved Dave, had gone in and pulled him out of that burning wreckage of the vehicle. And I felt his hands reach through that fire. I couldn't see him and how he found me. He says, to this day, I don't know either. And he pulled me over the side. I went over to Dave and I grabbed him and then pulled him away because, again, things were starting to cook off. And I mean, this flame was just shooting over his head. And uh, it, it was it was it was so hot when I when I grabbed Dave by his webbing to pull him, it, it burned my hands. That's how hot his clothing was. And I mean, you know, later on, I mean, you could see the burns on him where his webbing was. It was just, you know, he was being cooked, just cooked to death. And uh, and then soon we were we we're airborne, and I'll never forget the look on the pilot and the crew chief's faces. They were looking at me and giving me the thumbs up. Hang in there, guy. Hang in there. You know, and I couldn't help but think about 11 years earlier to this month of August, I was in Vietnam flying medevacs, looking at these guys that were bringing on the helicopters and stepped on booby traps and been mortared, shot up and, and firefights and saying the same thing to them. But 11 years later, to the very day, there I am. I had no idea of what I would give up, what I would lose, or also what I would gain from that experience. And only, you know, in retrospect, uh, at my age, being mid-50s, do I look back and see what I gave up, the people that are friends of mine that, that are dead, um, the people that made it through that are still the closest of friends to me, the camaraderie we have, um, the absolute love and affection and uh, fraternity that we have now, you know, as, as old men, I guess. Um, was worth every penny of it. Uh, plus the, the insight that I believe that I was given uh, by this kind of experience. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. If anything, the, the highlight was the Pathfinders. Yeah. I love them.